Um, I mean, before I, I want to start, uh, I just uh, wanted to say thank you, first of all, for your time and uh, energy that, you know, like, uh, I know that you're, you know, studying a lot of new ideas and uh, giving us your time, you know, it's, it's very valuable for us. But uh, at the same time, frankly speaking, during the pandemic, it's always really, really hard for us to, uh, let's just say, maintain these events, because as you can imagine, we don't have in-person events. And at the same time, really try to bring people into the community online. It's always hard. And uh, one of the good things that we managed to do in the middle of all of these points is that uh, we managed to at least get one global sponsor, and that is our law firm CMS that, uh, you know, they try to help us at least try to some extent, uh, you know, bring this together. And I just want to also say, you know, some thank you on their side that uh, they try to help us uh, help entrepreneurs. I'm not going to take the time more than that. So if you don't mind, let's just uh, do a quick introduction and introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. So my name is Dmitry. I live in Poland. I'm from Ukraine, but I grew up in Greece. So I speak fluent Greek as well. Um, I'm a tech guy, so I have built quite a few projects regarding cloud industries, CDN, stuff like that. One of the few more, more popular ones are Jazz Deliver, which is a free CDN for open source projects. We serve about 100 billion requests per month there. Um, some might know my other projects like cdnperf.com, dnsperf.com. Um, that those two projects actually then became a real startup, which is known as PerfOps. I raised their $1.2 million and we did analytics for CDN providers and DNS providers and also smart uh, load balancing of web traffic. And currently, I'm working on my new startup called Athlete, where we do edge compute. Wow. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, uh, because I'm sure that there is a lot of very interesting techie stuff to start with, but uh, it, it is the funding months, and uh, we're talking about funding, and you're a perfect person for that. But on top of that, if you don't mind, story of entrepreneurs always start with themselves. So uh, when I was taking a look at your website, I would just see that, okay, so... I think this is a Ukrainian name, but then I went to your website and I said that you speak English, Greek, and like uh, learning Polish and you don't speak Ukrainian. <laughs> and I was like, how is that possible? Uh, yeah, because I'm from the Russian part of Ukraine. So mm -hmm. I basically Russian is my native language. And then I moved to Greece where I basically forgot Russian and I never actually learned, learned any Ukrainian. So, <laughs> okay. And uh, is it like a common destination, like from like Ukraine to go to Greece? Like, I guess it was back in the 90s when my mother moved there and she just took me with her. But now I don't think so. <laughs> back then, Greece was much, much more, you know, more stable, I guess. I understand. I mean, considering the weather, I would never question that, but I would just try to also understand if there were some strategic things behind it. Yeah, not really. <laughs> just better <laughs> life. Yeah. And when did you move to Poland? Um, I guess uh, around five years ago. Five years ago. And how did you like it? Uh, yeah, well, actually, when I moved here, I was still working for Max CDN, a CDN mm -hmm. company in California. And uh, I was exploring how I can move back to Europe because that's where I came from, where I grew up. And Poland was kind of the most optimal choice. Mm -hmm. uh, based on all parameters, it was best taxes, easier to get to, a uh, strong economy. Krakow is a very European city. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I moved here. It was very nice. I opened here my first uh, company and I started doing consulting work. And then I quit my old job and yeah, then I started financing my startups using my revenue. How old you were when you were moved to Poland? When you moved to Mm, 20. 20. Wow. Um, was it easy for a 20 year old to open up a company? Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> why not? <laughs> I actually had already did that uh, back in Ukraine. I actually opened the company remotely in UK. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, back then I was like 17 years old. Uh, so I didn't really understand <laughs> much 
how to run it so it didn't go anywhere but this time i had lawyers I had accountants and we did everything right so you open up a company in the uk when you were 16. yeah yeah <laughs> where did you get the motivation for that uh well i always wanted to like have my own company do my own thing i never actually really enjoyed working for anyone so i back then i was really interested in uh, web hosting server stuff like that so i wanted to open my own uh, web hosting company and i had no idea how to do it in ukraine but it was quite easy uh, to do it in the uk uh, so i kind of tried that it didn't work out but it was a pretty good experience for me you know like just talking about my own experience so i have uh, like a, another room that I sometimes i used to rent and the one time a guy called me and I was like, yes, I would like to rent the other room. And I was like, of course. So the guy was supposed to come over and see the place. And I opened the door and I saw a kid is in front of me. And I was like, so you want to do that? And I was like, yes. And I was like, how old are you? And I was like 16. And I was like, okay, but what do you do? And I was like, I study at the university in Warsaw. Then I was like, but you're 16. And I was like, yes, because I'm Ukrainian. <laughs> like, okay, but I, usually we don't see Ukrainian, like a 16 year old studying at the university. And it was a very strange thing for me. Even when you say at the age of 16, you were not trying to work for other companies. Usually people at the age of 16 don't want to work anywhere. So is it a mindset? Like how, how is this different from other countries? Well, I actually never went to university, so I can talk about that. I started working when I was 16. Uh, I was doing like computer servicing, like fixing up computers for people. Uh, then I was hired as a junior developer in, in a US company in, in Ukraine. But I guess the motivation there is that people want a better life. And Ukraine, at least not in Kiev, is the life there is not very good. People don't have a lot of money. The life outside is not <laughs> it's very nice. <laughs> So they try their best to basically move away or do something to get money going and basically, you know, get, start living like a European uh, modern life. So I guess that's why people move to Warsaw to go to university at 16 years old. That's why I opened the company and yeah. You know, like there is this uh, saying that um, uh, tough uh, times create tough yeah. Oh, like tough people create is, yeah. is this this vicious circle that like is it happening like like do you really think that that tough position is is the result of success i think so because in my case i came from a very poor family so i couldn't rely on pretty much anyone to do to help me out in the future to get me to university or just you know pay my rent or something like that i had to from a very young age I had to figure out how i'll be able to do it myself and education, I don't really believe in that, like at least not in Ukraine. Uh, but in, in other countries as well, you get the, your degree, you spend four or five years there, and what's, what's next? You just start from scratch again. In my case, I had like five year head start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really interesting. Like uh, going back to the Peter Thiel and a lot of, let's just say, other people that they have the exact same mindset as you. I mean, um, I don't know how much you can compare yourself with Vitalik, but like I also have the same thing because he was also a part of um, a Peter Thiel Foundation. And the idea in there is that they only hire very, very young people before university because they really believe that if you are really a genius if you really know exactly how to run a company you don't really need the higher education but on the other hand i also have some other friends for example like my friend marek he is doing some philanthropy activities in east asia so he brings people that again the same thing as you mentioned i would say even way more extreme he basically get the kids off the street and try to teach them computer and then after that when they manage to get their job and then you know we in the let say right age then they will start working in big corporations. So you can imagine that in the end, there's going to be a very, let's just say, fair uh, uh, salary for them. And at the same time, people that they don't see themselves as, let's just say, they're not as open-minded as you. They do not really see that there are such a high positions that they can have. They will basically buy that education, not maybe higher education like a university, but they manage to somehow elevate themselves into the next level. Another thing, to be honest with you, that is also a question for me, because I 
I'm going to tell you something funny. Like when I came to Poland, I think my Russian started to become better than my Polish because I was a student and, and uh, most of the people in my uh, uh, dormitory, they were either Russians or they were Ukrainians. Uh, and I always have these things like I was trying to say something just to impress my Ukrainian friends. I was like, no, that's Russian. That's wrong. And then all of a sudden, then I learned what is the difference between Ukrainian and Russian. I was like, my Ukrainian friends talk to each other in Russian. And I really never get that. So is it a bad thing that if somebody said to a Ukrainian that something is Russian and you understand it? Like, where, where do you draw the line there? It really depends on where the person is from in Ukraine. Because, mm -hmm. like, in Kiev, I would say it's 50-50. Like, half the people, they speak Russian in everyday life with everyone. They go to the restaurant, they order in Russian, and maybe the... The person there replies in Ukrainian, so it's kind of like you speak them in Russian, they speak to you in Ukrainian, <laughs> you understand each other because I can understand Ukrainian, but I can't really speak it. And mm -hmm. the same goes for many Ukrainians that can understand Russian, but can't speak Russian. So <laughs> it's a big mix, yeah. So I guess some of them will, will not feel comfortable if, if you assume that they know Russian because they're Ukrainian, but they probably know Russian. <laughs> <laughs> In my yeah. case, I don't even know Ukrainian, so you'll be best if you speak Russian. <laughs> okay. Like, um, do you know this uh, documentary maker, Jimmy? Um, I always forget his last name. Uh, Harris, I think. He, is, uh, he used to make videos for Vox uh, uh, and other very interesting places on YouTube. And he used to be a traveler before COVID. And uh, he recently made a video about Russia. And he was basically talking about the cultural diversity and at the same time, all the different, uh, let's just say, 80 states that they are in Russia and how much like culturally, language wise and everything, they're ethnically different from each other. And I'm very surprised that why everybody just put everything as like Russian and nobody really just separates these things. And is this the same thing also in Ukraine? Well, I, I think I'm not the right person to ask this because like I lived in Ukraine for I don't know, five years, so I'm not like an expert in <laughs> Ukrainian culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school in Greece. I finished like one uh, one year of school in Ukraine, so I don't know pretty much anything about Ukrainian history <laughs> or Russian history. So yeah, I know more about the Greek history than Ukrainian. Wow. I mean, that's a funny thing, because I also know a bit more about the Greek history, because that's a bit more, let's just say, historically, it was always a very interesting place to, to study and, and everything. Yeah. But frankly speaking, if I see your stereotype and, and let's just say, uh, um, even see the way that you're developing yourself, I'm more have the personality or, or persona of a person that is Russian Ukrainian rather than a Greek person, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So if you don't mind, uh, like, because it was very important for me that, you know, like yeah, we get to know a bit better and at the same time, you know, uh, it's always important from technology point of view, but who is the person in front of us that also somehow changes, uh, let's just say, a perspective of uh, how the business starts. If you don't mind, let's just start step by step because we have a lot of jargons that we have to get out of the system. What is a CDN? Uh, it's a content delivery network. So mm -hmm. it's a bunch of servers globally that hosts some kind of content and when a user wants to download that content he connects to the server closest to him so normally when you don't have a cdn if you are in warsaw you connect to new york and you download but if you have a cdn you'll probably connect from warsaw to warsaw and download from warsaw so the performance would be much much better so it's a way to optimize the web performance of your websites okay. And uh, for example, like sometimes you are on Forbes or on others, and when you're clicking this whole thing on, on your browser, you basically see that you are redirected to a CDN URL rather than HTTP. Is this the same? Uh, not really. I'm not sure what you mean. You mean the AMP URL? But, exactly. Uh, yeah, the AMP is a Google technology, so it's not a CDN in itself, it's more of a framework on how you should build your websites so that they will be faster. But it also uses a CDN below that. So when you connect to Forbes and you like get the HTML, the HTML probably comes from a central location, but all the images and videos, they come from a CDN. And how many people you say right now they used uh, for the, the JS Deliver, the first startup? Uh, we have 100 billion requests per month. Wow. 
I mean, talking about the startups that I know that they do not have two clients, like how does that uh, translate into really clients for you? Well, Gdeliver is a bit of a strange thing because it's a free service. So I started it like 10 years ago and it has grown passively over the years. I haven't done any kind of active marketing or any promotion or anything like that. There was basically just demand for this kind of service and people just find it on Google and they just like it and use it. Um, so what it has given me is mostly it opens doors to me because it's a very popular service. Many people know about it, especially those in the cloud and CDN industries. They know just deliver. And when I call someone or write to them and they see that I built it, they just immediately want to talk to me because they <laughs> that way I'm actually someone. And that's a big issue with most European people because all the tech you know, innovation, it happens in California. So if you are somewhere in Europe or Ukraine, you're kind of stuck outside the, the party. So you cannot just go to an event or a meetup in LA and just meet a bunch of Google employees, you know, and do something together. Uh, and that's exactly where Jetliver helped me because it kind of emulates that because they, it gives me some kind of, uh, I guess, validation uh, to their eyes, and it help, has helped me with pretty much everything. When I open my uh, commercial startups like Perfops or Athlete, I use Just Deliver as a promotional tool. And because mm -hmm. I already have uh, the community, the open source community that is using that, and there's a bunch of people out there that visit the website daily, they Basically, I convert those people that use our free service into paying customers for my other startups. I understand. Uh, is there any way to monetize uh, an open source platform? Uh, it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> In case of Just Deliver, the issue there is that it's not like it's not an open source project in itself. Like there is no value in the code itself. The value of Just Deliver is in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So Just Deliver uses multiple CDN providers at the same time. So even if one of them goes down, the delivery stays up. And that's where the value is. And so you cannot monetize just deliver because all the traffic and infrastructure we have, it comes from sponsors for free because they want to support the open source community. If I start adding paid features and start charging for the service, they will say, okay, now it's a commercial service. Why should they sponsor it? Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's in case of JetDeliver. In open source in general, like when you have a traditional software, which is open source, uh, it's the open source community basically helps you do marketing. So it mm -hmm. simplifies that, but it <laughs> makes uh, like converting people a lot, a lot harder because people assume that open source means free. And then they just cannot understand why should they be paying for an open source project? It's free. It should be free. Why should I pay for that? So people would try to do different things like it's open source, but you have to pay for extra features. You have to pay for support. But still, it's, it's a very complicated thing to yeah. do. And you do it right. And then you have the licensing issue where yeah. like, Amazon can just fork your project and offer it for free and just start selling it. And <laughs> Did that happen to you? No, but it happened to Elasticsearch, right? A few weeks ago, where they Amazon just forked their project and they just started offering that on their platform without paying anything to Elasticsearch. So it's a real problem. Um, another thing that also uh, I'm sure you know way better is is the whole idea that does CDM provide a level of uh, decentralization for the servers? Uh, do CDM providers offer virtualization? Uh, decentralization. Ah, decentralization. Um, not really, <laughs> because you still use the, the one entity. And even though they have locations globally, it doesn't really matter. They can just you know disable your account and you're down everywhere. In case of JetDeliver, it's a bit better because we, if a CDM provider decides they don't want to sponsor us anymore and they whatever happens we can just remove them and we have others uh, that can take their place uh, but if you are basically single entity and you have to use someone yeah there's no digitalization there anywhere 
So for example, like when somebody is, uses uh, JS Deliver, is this on a server, for example, like in Ukraine, or this is on like, a, it's it's like it's in all the different things. One is in Warsaw, one is in- yes, uh, yes. So JS Deliver has like more than 300 locations globally. So in Poland, we have in Warsaw. So if you are somewhere in Poland, you will probably connect to our server in Warsaw. If you are in Ukraine, you connect to Kyiv. If you are in Moscow, you connect to, to Moscow and so on. We have in Africa, in uh, Latin America, pretty much everywhere. And we're actually the only free CDN that has servers in mainland China. We actually have a license from the Chinese government mm -hmm. that allows us to operate there. And we have like, uh, we are white listed. So we have full performance. Yeah. So how is it possible that this is open source and cannot be monetized, but then you have all of those servers? I mean, like, I think cost of the server is usually the highest tech expense for a lot of startups. Yeah, so like I said, they are sponsors. They, the providers offer them to us for free, and we just list them on our website. You know, thank you to these companies for offering the servers. But still, like we serve, I think like four petabytes of data every month. If we had to pay for that, that would be more than a few million dollars per year. <laughs> <laughs> That's huge. And we get that all for free. But I still pay for a bunch of servers that actually run our code, the logic mm -hmm. that actually serves the files, know that we are pay for the services that run our routing logic and also pay for the freelancers and developers that help me build the service. So unfortunately, I can't find any sponsor for that because you know you cannot just put them on their logo on the website somewhere. Mm -hmm. And what made it so famous? Because I talked about it with a few people. Everybody knows that. Like, what wh what makes it so, let us say, unique and, and, and let us say, recognizable, considering that there are lots of other options in the market? So most other options are you have to pay for them. So if you consider free options, there's like three of them out there, and just deliver is one of them. And the difference of just deliver and the other free options is that we are the most active. We have, we are the only one who has a multi CDN system. In all other cases, the other projects, they have a single CDN. So if it goes mm -hmm. down, they go down with it. Mm -hmm. And so when they go down, we stay up because we have multiple CDN providers. We just remove that CDN provider and nothing happens to our users. Mm -hmm. And we also keep investing in the development of new features. So we hire developers, we, we started supporting a JS file compilation on the fly, which nobody else has. So we keep offering new features, better design, more locations, better uptime. And I guess that's what, also it took 10 years, right, to get here. <laughs> so over time, that helped. That's a good idea when you start early, you can easily say 10 years without, you know, like being uh, too late for that. Um, okay, so what was the second startup? Uh, so, the first like real commercial startup that I built was Perfops. Perfops. Okay. Do you want to talk about that also? Um, yeah. So how it became a reality. Um, so I was basically building a bunch of side projects when I had time. And I was curious who was the fastest DNS provider out there. Because you know what's the DNS provider? Is, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, and now because I wanted to use them for just deliver to have better performance, and there was no such data available online. So you just you had to trust their marketing basically, and everyone says they're the best. So I decided to benchmark them and find out for myself who is the fastest DNS provider out there. I did, and I decided to build a website around that. I built a website. I bought like. 40 servers around the globe to do constant benchmarking of all DNS providers. I built some charts and a ranking system. And basically that's it. I released it. I forgot about it for six months. And then I started getting emails from Microsoft, from Google, from Cisco. And they were basically saying, we found your website on Google. And it says that we are performing, like we are ranking fourth in your system. Why is that? Can you give us more data? Can we pay for this data? And I kept getting these emails. So I decided that it's a, it's a good niche because you have all these big companies and they're all willing to pay you to get access to your data. And yeah, that's how I started building Perfops. The original idea was that we're gonna 
monitor all DNS providers that are out there and all CDN providers. And we're going to build a lot more advanced charts per region, per city, per country. They can stack them. They can compare themselves to other providers. They can detect uh, uptime anomalies. If something happens in Berlin, maybe, for example, or uh, UPC is down and they can figure that out and to fix the routing, all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, and I started doing that myself. I was basically bootstrapping the startup. I hired developers here in Krakow and we kept building. Then we built CDN Perf, where we did the exact same thing, but for CDN providers. And then I had the idea that since we have this data, we can actually use that. So before that, the data was passive, right? It's there and you can analyze it, but it's up to you to make decisions on what to do next. So I wanted to make it uh, actively usable. So the idea was that we have the data and we can do smart load balancing based on the data. So you could use multiple CDN providers at the same time and basically rely on our data to handle your routing. So for example, five CDN providers have servers in Poland, but which one is fastest? Who knows? We know. <laughs> so we. Uh, you can pay us and we're going to route you to the best location possible of, out of, of all the providers available to you. So that was the idea, but it was a very expensive idea. So I decided that I'm going to try and raise some funding to basically build this second iteration of the, of the startup. Uh, I think until to that point, we had around 3,000 users registered but not paying. So people were interested in our data. They were registering. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this was focused to enterprise customers. So it was very hard to convert them to paying customers. And yeah, with this data, I went to Wolf Summit in Warsaw. I scheduled, I think, five meetings with uh, different VCs. And on that day, two of them agreed to invest to into performance wow. yeah <laughs> the first round was uh, 500k and yeah so we basically it took i think around six months to finish the whole thing the contracts the everything to there was a lot of back and forth with lawyers uh, stuff like that we got the money we started building the second iteration we raised the sec second round so in total we raised 1.2 million dollars and yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, the company went nowhere because we ran into the issue of enterprise sales, uh, mm -hmm. which is basically just too hard to do uh, because we had competitors in the US and you have a customer calling you and saying, OK, why should I use PowerFobs when I can use NS1 uh, in New York? And they raised $50 million and they have 100 developers. You guys have five developers. Yeah. <laughs> So at the end of the day, they just trust the company that has more money. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so it kept it kept coming up. And even companies that said, OK, we're going to buy your services. It took them like a year and a half to actually pay for these services. <laughs> yeah, so it was enterprise sales sucks. So <laughs> also my experience was mostly uh, working with developers, building open source communities. So all that experience wasn't really very use useful in this case. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I learned a lot from <laughs> this whole experience. I uh, lost a lot of money on that because I kept funding the company for like four years before we actually raised money. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I left and then I opened Athlete. Yeah. Um, do you want me to talk about it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So with Athlete, uh, the idea was that we're going to do B2B, uh, but we're going to focus on small companies, on developers, on open source projects, the things that have a lot of experience with. And basically, the problem of what we were, think, uh, we were solving was um, multi regional clustering. So before that, if I wanted to host a website in multiple locations, that wasn't really possible. 
So you could do it, but you have to do it manually and it would be very expensive to build, to maintain. You have to hire a development team to actually do that. So you just can't click a few buttons and you're good to go. Um, yeah, so I tried to, to solve this issue and we currently allow people to deploy their, um, their code bases to five global regions. And we plan to expand to, I think, at least 15 uh, this year and add more and more in, in the future. And we allow our customers to basically compile their services, their applications, websites, whatever, in a container and deploy it on Athlete. And then we handle the clustering, the failover, the load balancing, the maintenance, monitoring, pretty much everything. So it's a nice graphical UI where everything is simply explained and you don't have to have like a DevOps team to do it for you. If you're a little technical, you can just do it yourself as a business owner or as a product manager. Yeah, so that was the idea there. Uh, are you going to have a different sales in this uh, uh, startup or <laughs> what is your strategy? Yeah, so definitely. So this time we're focusing more on individual developers. Uh, because that's the people that like to play around with these kind of new technologies. And what happens next is basically they like it and then they go to their uh, employee uh, employer and they say, that, okay, I played around with this technology during my free time. We should use it in this company because it will solve many of our problems. And it works. <laughs> so we have been online only for two months and we see constant growth in both users and deployments. We were before that, I think like five months in beta. We saw many use cases. So people use Athlete for deploying basic websites to databases, to doing image optimization on the edge. Some people even do data crunching. So they like download big data files and they use our resources to analyze them. So yeah. And it's very flexible. For example, there are solutions out there like uh, Quad for Workers and Amazon Lambda. But the issue there is that they only support HTTP. Mm -hmm. And they have you have to use certain frameworks and certain languages. In our case, we use containers, so you can deploy even legacy applications. You can mm -hmm. use any language, any framework. And we actually give you access to the network layer. So you can open any port UDP or TCP, and you can deploy video streaming software, you can deploy databases, pretty much anything, not just HTTP websites. Um, let's just also talk a bit uh, about ideology and, and structure. Um, I was listening, uh, let me just put one step backward and, and then talk about something a bit more profound. Um, a lot of things that you see in startups, uh, they have a very, let's just say, profound connection to, especially to the acting and, and movie industry. Because the same way that you pitch your idea, uh, way back there was a startups, there were basically actors and directors and copywriters that they were basically pitching their ideas to get investment. And, and that's why sometimes, frankly speaking, I see very even more sober uh, uh, suggestions and, and ideas that literally they come from uh, the, the movie industry rather than from, uh, let's just say, the, the startup industry. And then there was this director and he was saying that if you walk around the, you know, the Hollywood Boulevard and ask people which kind of movie do you want to make, you know, like Spielberg and, you know, like Soderbergh and these major directors would never make their movies like that. They know exactly what the, let's just say, the audience would uh, watch. And then after that, they put their own creativity in it. And at the same time, they know that by the time that this is going to hit the box office, people are just going to go there and watch their movies. But what we really see right now in startup ecosystem are two different things. One, startup that they do basically zero market research. And they basically say that, you know what, everybody is just digging for Facebook for dogs. And that is the biggest thing, you know, like next thing. And I'm just going to be the Mark Zuckerberg and everything is going to go fine. Then we are going to have other people that they go so deep into the market research that the idea becomes so, let's just say, mundane. And, and let's just say it's going to be so simple that by the time it's going to come out, then basically people are just going to see that, uh, you know what, it's good. But I already am using something so close to them. 
kind of what you mentioned, why should I switch to another service provider? But what I see as a pattern in, in your startup is that financially good or bad, they always have lots and lots of different users. So how do you come up with your idea? And at the same time, um, how do you maintain it? <laughs> Uh, well, in case of athlete, uh, I was basically solving my own problem, right? Mm -hmm. So I had this issue and I couldn't find a solution out there. I talked to a few friends in the same industry that had the same problem and basically the solution was just do it yourself. <laughs> I, I was happy with that. And now the, the, ne the next big thing is Kubernetes, but mm -hmm. it's it's very complicated piece of software. It's very hard to maintain, to deploy. And pretty much if you ask someone how to do what Apple does, they will say, use Kubernetes. But I don't have the money to do that. So what do I do? You do nothing. So <laughs> uh, I guess I'm kind of more in the first category where I did minimal uh, <laughs> research, but that was mostly because I was in the same industry, I knew about the problem I had myself. So I didn't really need to invest like a year into doing research and analysis, stuff like that. So that helps if when you are in the same, yeah. So let's just say that uh, you will be uh, a founder with uh, hands-on business, uh, hands-on uh, the, 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 okay. By the way, another Kubernetes, like last time I was just reading the article that nobody wants to take care of the Kubernetes. Too. Did you read that? They're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> You there? I kind of lost you there for a second. Yeah. I, uh, I was just saying that. So, what is your opinion about uh, you know the current state of Kubernetes? Do you want to maybe explain what Kubernetes is? Maybe because we're just talking too much about one specific thing. And yeah, so Kubernetes is a technology that allows you to orchestrate, um, I guess, an infrastructure backend to host your uh, web applications uh, using containers. So before that, we had Docker, where you just compile your software into a container and you run it. But it's not really, uh, it doesn't automate anything. You have to have a bunch of tools. So Kubernetes is basically like a bunch of tools stuck together, that allow you to uh, build your own cloud, I guess. That would be the easiest to understand uh, explanation. Um, but it's a piece of software built by developers for developers. So there's no simple UI or anything like that. You have to do configure everything in uh, config files using command line tools. And it breaks pretty often. <laughs> so you have to know <laughs> what you're doing or it's going to go down. And when it goes down, it goes down hard. So it's not going to have like a small issue for five minutes. You're going to have to spend a few hours to get it back online. Uh, but yeah, it's everyone is using that. So it's a, I would say it's an enterprise tool. It's not mm -hmm. built for small businesses or developers. Yeah. But again, going back to your ideas, again, let's just say that there are some uh, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk that, uh, you know, like, again, they, um, let's just say a lot of people call him even like CEO and everything, but he's usually a chief engineering officer. You know, he is a person that uh, it's not just a, let's just say, marketing person or a person who knows how to sell the stuff. Uh, he is a person who understands how, let's just say, you know, like what is inside the engine. And, and this is something that I really feel we miss in so many different entrepreneurs. Uh, and he also have this idea that, you know, like there are so many MBAs and and you know like uh, uh, these people in, inside the startups how do you really see like is this something that is a systematic problem or like how, how do we have to have more entrepreneurs that would be more of your profile than others mm, well <laughs> i guess most technical people they just they want to build stuff and not care about the business part of the of everything they just want to build the technology and that's it, that, that's what's interesting to them. So I guess the there's no real solution here because you're not gonna force the developer to become a CEO if he's not interested in that. So in my case, I kind of, <laughs> I like doing both. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't really enjoy doing sales per se, but the whole business side, the marketing, building of these tools, it's very interesting to me. And yeah, so I guess you just have to uh, teach that or basically show to more people that it's not as hard as they think it is. So it's not that hard to get funding. It's not that hard to open a business and pay taxes and get an accountant. It's not that difficult. And that's what many people are afraid of, so that it will, it will take all their time. But it, it's not really. Uh, until you have like a, a few hundred K of MRR, you, you're not going to spend a lot of time doing accounting or anything like that. You can even do it yourself if you want to. Uh, so I guess that's what people don't they have no idea what goes into the business side of running startups. So they're afraid of that. If they knew more about it and there were more, there, there was more content out there, I think there would be a, a solution. So do you think the idea is that make more, let's just say, developers into entrepreneurs or try to teach more technology to entrepreneurs? Mm, well, <laughs> I vote for the first. <laughs> <laughs> business to developers because teaching uh, tech to an entrepreneur or a business guy it's a lot more difficult because it requires certain thinking of understanding and there's just so much that exists in tech like the, the stack is huge and every single part of that has its own huge uh, back end so you have to kind of understand pretty much everything in there so it's a lot more difficult you have to spend like a few years just to start getting some kind of understanding of that. If you're doing something technical, if you're just building an e-commerce website, of course, you don't require all that. But teaching how to run a business and raise funding to a developer is a lot easier and faster. What about the risk? Because, you know, a lot of people just would like to work for other companies because they say, you know what, at least I know that this is my MRR and, and at the same time, uh, this is my, let's just say, social security and, and my benefits. And I just don't want to take the risk of running a business. Uh, yeah, so the risk is there, but the risk is not what most people think it is, right? So um, it's... Well, it depends on the situation, but in most cases, you're not going to go into bankruptcy and you're going to lose your house or, you know, you're going to owe the money that you raised. That's not the case. If the, the startup doesn't go well, oh, well, right? It's okay. You continue. You can go find a job and start working there. So it's not like you go in debt, right? Unless, of course, you actively pursue that and you go to a bank and you get money to build your startup, which I don't really recommend doing. So the risk here is that you're going to lose a few years of revenue if you are working mm -hmm. at a real company, at a big company. So if you're a developer and you make you know, $5,000 per month uh, and you spend a whole year building a startup, so you lost like that revenue from your salary. But I would say <laughs> that's it. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're doing something really wrong, uh, the risk is not <laughs> that big. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is your advice to startups that wants to do fundraising? Mm, well, there are many advices here. Um, so I guess, well, if you are in Europe, right? So we're assuming that because in the US it's a lot easier <laughs> differently. Um, if you're in Europe, you should probably decide what do you really need a VC? Because in Europe, most VCs are small ones and they don't have the resources that US-based VCs have. So what you're going to get from them is the money, and basically that's it. You're not going to get any kind of real support. You, nobody's going to write about you. You're not going to get any media coverage that you raised 100K from some unknown VC. Nobody really cares about that. There are many VCs out there. But if you raise from VC, from YC or from you know Sequoia, of course you're gonna get mentioned in TechCrunch, and your client is gonna like that, and so on. So in when I first raised my first uh, capital, I didn't really understand all that, so I was just happy with the money I got. And now I'm more looking forward to working with companies, VCs that have. Uh, other resources at their disposal, not just the, the money that they can offer. 
So in my case, I don't really need the money that much as much as I need um, to get value to my branding, to, to the name athlete. If people start associating athlete with a big VC or that it has uh, great partners and it's very well networked, that's more valuable to me than raising like half a million dollars or a million dollars. Um, of course, money, money is just going to speed up your development. It's not going to solve your problem. So if you if you, you were you weren't moving, if you were standing on in, in, in a place, the money isn't going to get you anywhere. It's mm -hmm. just basically fuel to get to move faster. Uh, but money and resources and branding and media coverage that could you that could get you moving a lot faster, even just because of that, you know, the networking that you're going to get. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. Um, next, uh, what everyone says in the, in the VC world is that they're not investing in the company, they're investing in the founders. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, they don't really care about like the product itself. Well, of course it has to, <laughs> to be a good product, but if there are not other competitors out there or it doesn't, the design is bad or something else doesn't really matter. They are looking more at the founding team and what they have achieved previously. So if you are gonna, if you're a student uh, starting a startup, it's gonna be a lot harder. I would recommend maybe building a few side projects that you could show for, you know, I built these five things and they are really cool. So I can build this thing as well. Uh, or you know, go work for a big company. Say, okay, I work for Google, so I can I'm gonna build that. I have the networking from my previous employer. How I know many people that can help me with that. So if you have no network, no resources, no previous experience, it's gonna be really tough. So you have to make sure that, except from the product itself, you have uh, some kind of value to your name, right? Maybe mentions, maybe hire a PR company. I don't know to get some mentions in the media to you know, partner up with open source project to say, okay, I, I helped those guys to release the second version of their open source project, which is very popular. And I learned a lot, I gained access to the community and can leverage that to help me with my startup, right? Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Mm, yeah, also, I guess the state, of your project like if you come to them with just an idea i don't really recommend doing that unless you are elon musk so yeah <laughs> you have to have to like show them something that actually works not just you know some image i hired a designer for a hundred dollars to design me this it doesn't really mean anything you want to show them that you spent hours of your time thinking about that thinking about how it we interact together that you actually care enough to spend your own free time on that for free because they're going to spend a lot of money on you. So you should at least spend some, some of your hours on this. In my case, it was, I guess, easier for me because I could show them that the product already exists. Mm -hmm. It has already users, not paying ones. So back then we didn't really have really any kind of revenue. But it didn't matter because we already had the product, we had users, and I could show to them that I actually paid for everything myself using my own money for many years. So that's kind of, uh, they want to, they really like that because they saw that I'm really invested into the idea that I spent so much time and my own money. And so now we're more, more of a, like partners, right? I invest in my own money, they invest their own money. So we're kind of equal partners in this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean, they were very interesting and, and um, you know, one of the things that I also really like is that they are based on real experience and it's not just based on books and, you know. Oh, yeah, or... and always have a good lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> that's really important because the first version of the contract you're going to get, it's not the version you're going to sign. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they hope that you're going to sign the first version they're going to give you but you really shouldn't. You should give it to a lawyer who's gonna review it and change a lot of things. That's gonna make it a lot more palatable and more, you know, to protect your rights, not just theirs. So that's really important. 
Another question I also wanted to ask, especially because we live across different countries, like what is the best country in your opinion for developers and entrepreneurs? You mean to live in? To live in and operate in, yeah. Um, well, I personally really, really like the Netherlands. Um, I've been there many times. I I worked there for for a few weeks. Um, I actually work from London, but it's I think way too chaotic. And now with the Brexit, it's not really a good place to be. But I think Netherlands, it's it, everything is there. Like it's. Um, you have a bunch of VCs there. You can go to meetings too. You have a bunch of startups there already. Um, the there's like the English language is default, so you don't even have to learn <laughs> any language. So that's really helpful if you don't speak Polish or you like your background doesn't doesn't allow you to learn Polish because you come from Greece or whatever. Uh, yeah, I really enjoy that. Okay, I really enjoy Amsterdam. Nice. Um, okay, so let's just, um, you know, just to somehow wrap it up and then try to uh, put the whole thing. By the way, I really like your t-shirt because, you know, like just do it, I think it pretty much sums up exactly what you're doing. So, you know, like I would say that was the right choice of t-shirt. Uh, um, uh, it is very interesting that first of all, if people would have started a bit earlier, then let's just say by the age of 27, they can talk about 10 years of experience in, 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 in our field. While if you really finish your university and then try to be totally theoretical, by your age, they just want to basically try to find an internship somewhere. And, and that changes the whole perspective of, uh, let's just say, that person and also their own internal, let's just say, personal experiences and expectations into the next level. Another thing is also is this being customer oriented or, or let's just say product oriented mentality that what exactly, you know, like uh, should be the main, uh, let's just say topic for the entrepreneur and at the same time, which one of them is going to bring you the first customer? Because what a lot of people unfortunately don't understand is that the product without a customer just an idea right and, and, and i mean unless you're just you know like again you're so much into something that you just literally want to build it for yourself and uh, another thing is also is i would say this gap between the technology and management that we also see unfortunately in many form or shapes uh, either the person who is responsible for the business does not understand the core of the business or the person had, that only understand the core of the business thinks that management is just a, let's just say um, uh, an overlap, right? Yeah, I could just like like oh, I know everything about what I'm doing, so why do I need to bring another person who just wants to basically run the company? And and I really feel um, you know simplifying business is not the right thing to do, but at the same time there are some very big mistakes that a lot of people do and makes this uh, let's just say whole. Um, hopefully a happy journey of entrepreneurship into a very sad story. Um, just to make it a bit less, let's just say, serious and at the same time have something uh, because, you know, like we don't have that much time. Uh, you talk about a lot of successes that you had. So do you want to also talk about one fuck ups or just something that you did as a mistake with all the startups? Uh, well, it depends on what you think is a fuck up, right? So. Technically, Perfops was kind of a failure, right? Because I lost a lot of money and I didn't make it back, but I learned a lot. So that's kind of has a lot of value to that. But overall, if you think it just from the numbers perspective, that was kind of, uh, <laughs> I lost a lot of money and time on that. Um, I often fall into the trap of what you said, like, build it first and people will come uh, and they will not come <laughs> uh, i but there's another side to that so if you keep building stuff and you hope people will come and they don't um, eventually what you get is experience so you can the next time you build something you have something you have learned something mm -hmm. and even if you didn't make any money to that you can still show that as a showcase of what you can build when you either build something new or go to work for someone. But that's that's beside the point, right? <laughs> um, well, we had uh, quite a few technical fuck ups in the company, right? As pretty much everyone does. But I think that would be pretty boring for most people here. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> 
Perfops was was that, yeah. I mean, <laughs> one thing that I hope is is going to be the fact that you know, like choosing Poland was not one of them, uh, and you know, yeah. uh, because uh, again, like. I also could basically put it easily in an equation that you could always go to Russia because, well, like, uh, the the infrastructure there. I, I think I was watching one uh, BBC documentary about like this, like a Russian Silicon Valley, and, and like you know all, all the things that they have, and also the size of the um, uh, some of the companies that they're IT based in Russia. They are huge, and even you know like this, like was that the contact like the, these websites, like or Yandex. The corruption there is a really big issue. So non-functioning uh, courts and corruption doesn't really make it a very good place for a startup to be. Mm -hmm. If something goes wrong, you want to be sure that you can go to court and win it. And corruption and money is not going to change the outcome of the of the court, right? So if you're going to sue Yandex and you're right, in Poland, you probably win. In Russia, you will not because Yandex is <laughs> made anything. So, I don't really agree that Russia or Ukraine are a really good places to be for a startup, mostly because their political situation and instability. That's why Poland strikes a really good balance here, right? Because it's very economical to be here. It's not too expensive. It's very European. It's open borders. You can go anywhere. You can make business with anyone. And you have the backing of a stable government, low taxes, functioning courts, and like a the system works here, right? I mean, it's always good to, you know, like uh, have these positivities and, and everything around because, again, uh, you know, I, I came to Poland uh, with all the positivities and all the things around it. One of the first things that people taught me is to come and complain. That, you know, like when you're coming here, you basically have to start complaining about a lot of stuff. But no, there's so many positivities and, and things to enjoy that uh, it doesn't really make sense to, to have that attitude. Again, I just wanted to say thank you very much for uh, giving us your time. And uh, it was very, let us say, interesting and fruitful. And uh, I also want to say thank you for the guys that, uh, you know, uh, stay with us. Uh, we're going to hopefully try to uh, cut it a little bit and then try to put it on social media that later also people can also benefit from most of the advices and these interesting stories on your side. If there's anything else you want to add, now would be the right time. Uh, actually, I saw a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do I make my money? Um, yeah. So I do consulting for big tech companies. And that's how basically I fund uh, and bootstrap my startups. So I actually work not full time. So I have like retainers with some big corporations. So it's almost like passive money. <laughs> But to get there is not uh, simple, so I, I wouldn't recommend that as a solution to everyone. Um, future plans for startup. Well, for startup, if if that's just the liver, then I have a lot of plans on developing the the features and adding more stuff. Uh, if it's perfect, I have no idea because I love the company, so <laughs> no plans there. Okay, perfect. So hopefully we're going to finish it on time. Uh, I also, Mehmet, sorry for not looking at that. Frankly speaking, I'm just in a conference room and, and the lights went off by itself and there's no way for me to fix it. And that's also another problem that I had to just see I have to fix it. But, you know, last minute things and, uh, you know, like this small focus is a part of the startup. So I hope everybody would, uh, you know, accept my apologies for that one. Again, uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us your time and uh, hopefully we will stay in touch and uh, learn more from all of the things that you do and good luck with your new startup. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank having you. me. Bye-bye. Yeah, Have a good day. Bye.